Welcome to History Gossip with myself, Julian Heaviside, and Michelle Perez. Today's topics, independence narratives, past and present, we will be discussing the legacies of Simón Bolívar, José Martí, and José Martí as reimagined by Hugo Chávez and Fidel Castro. So Simón Bolívar is perhaps one of the best known independence leaders. Julian, what comes to your mind when you think of Simón Bolívar? Well, I think about how he spoke of Latin American uni unity, solidarity, and how this vision applied to America as a whole in what he called Pan America. That's true, but he was also known for being an anti-imperialist, a military hero, and a deaf, part, uh, deaf politician. He was actually a very articulate speaker. I see. So his visions go beyond his embodiment as a man from history. They have been spectacularized and imagined through visual representations. Why don't we take a look at that one documentary of Simón Bolívar? Solo 47 años, dirigió las guerras independentistas de Venezuela, Colombia, Perú, Ecuador y creó a Bolivia. Mundialmente se le valora como uno de los militares más brillantes de todos los tiempos. Redactor de constituciones y proyectos de leyes, varias veces presidente, nacido en rica cuna y muerto pobre la posibilidad de declararse emperador y el título que siempre prefirió fue el de Libertador. La biografía de Simón Bolívar. Spectacular. He's practically a Hollywood hero. The dramatization of his character makes you wonder like, what his true story is. How did he get to stand for Latin American sovereignty? Bolívar was born into a wealthy family from Caracas, Venezuela. His arist aristocratic family relied on plantation slavery. He actually became an orphan at the age of nine. Did you know that? I didn't, actually. He actually left for Europe at age 16, where he was influenced by the Enlightenment. Did you know he was also influenced by George Washington? Yeah, he held him up as a hero. Isn't there a rumor that he kept a lock of his hair in a medallion? <laughs> yeah, the medallion was actually a gift from Washington, but I wonder if the lock of hair was as well. Bolivar intentionally molded himself in Washington's image to the point that he became known to some as the George Washington of South America. And by the age of 22, Bolivar had pledged to liberate Spanish America from Spain. But why would Bolivar want to disrupt the system if he was already at the top? True, Bolivar was an aristocrat, but as a criollo in the Spanish colonies, he would never be equal in status to the peninsulares of peninsular Spain. At first, it's confusing to imagine how a wealthy aristocrat benefiting from the inequality in Latin America could possibly have anything to fight for. He already had it all, but in the caste system of Latin America, Bolivar didn't have it all. I see. So independence from Spain offered an opportunity to elevate his status to match that of the peninsulares. Exactly. This appealed to Bolivar and his peers at first, but it did not directly appeal to the citizens of lower class. So Bolivar began by framing the caste system as the root of oppression in Latin America, and Spain imposed this system, so Spain was the enemy. So abolishing the caste system would clean the slate, bear a new nation, and allow identities to be shaped by individuals and citizens instead of by the caste system. This is probably why, if we take a look at the famous letter to Jamaica, we can see his determination to liberate Spanish America in his rhetoric. He even uses the term slave states. Yeah, this language was especially appealing to those who were actually legal slaves. Real slaves had everything to gain from independence, and they would come to make up a large proportion of the insurgent armies fighting against Spanish arms. He also mentioned in this letter how, under the rule of Spain, Spanish America would remain in permanent infancy. He wanted to manage their own domestic affairs. So there's a lot of talk about how Bolivar is el libertador, but what particular countries did he even liberate? So he wasn't actually a one-man fighter. Bolivar led the independence in Venezuela, Colombia, Panama, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia, which was actually Upper Peru. It was named after him. But let's bear in mind 
that he wasn't the only one fighting these battles. Each nation had their freedom fighter and continued to hold them as such, such as San Martí in Argentina and Miguel Hidalgo in Mexico. So, what was his vision, and why is it still relevant today? So, in his letter from Jamaica, written in 1815, Bolivar sets up his grand vision of a pan-Latin America that is united on a political and military front based on their geographical position and colonial history. But he doesn't believe it can be accomplished at the time. He writes, I cannot persuade myself that the new world can at the moment be organized as a great republic. However, he believes strongly in, his, in this vision and continues to fight multiple battles to break ties with Spain and hope that in the future that Latin America could unite and fully recover from the wounds inflicted by Spanish rule. Right. Unfortunately for Bolivar, the years following independence led to civil wars, dictatorships, and ambitions for a national identity instead of a pan-Latin American identity. Since Bolivar's vision has remained unfulfilled, leaders in contemporary history and currently have taken on the responsibility to fulfill them. Hugo Chavez is such an example. What Bolivar wanted was for Spanish Americans to identify themselves with Latin America as a whole. To do this, Bolivar made Spain the other. However, citizens of different nations started to identify themselves in contention with other nations. Disillusioned, Bolivar gave up on this hope. Right. Hugo Chavez, however, did not. Chavez gains popular favor through generating an enthusiasm for the Bolivarian dream that Chavez promises to realize. Through an analysis of his speeches or a viewing of his talk show, A lo Presidente, one can observe Chavez's blatant attempt to appear as a Bolivarian defender. So we are going to exemplify this through a series of videos and speeches. Just look at this first image. It would seem that Bolivar is the president of Venezuela instead of Chavez. Just look at the size of his portrait. It makes Chavez look tiny. It reminds me of the mandatory portraits of dictators people were asked to have in their house so they can worship them on a daily basis. It is even animated to look realistic as if he were still alive today. This image shows how prominent Bolivar was during Chavez's 14-year-long presidency in Venezuela. Chavez reimagined Bolivar's life stories and amb ambitions to invent new narratives based on the old. For example, he named the leftist movement in Venezuela the Bolivarian Revolution and ruled under Bolivarismo. In Latin America since independence, Alexander Dawson says, History is not simply called from documents, but it is an act of interpretation built upon an act of interpretation. This is what Chavez is doing times ten. Let's take a look at how Chavez makes a spectacle out of a donation of two guns. Tráeme la caja, por favor. Yo voy a mostrar algo también que es muy importante, que me llegó como una donación, pero no para mí, para la República. Yo me imagino que con esta pistola fue que salió Manuel Azán a defender a Bolívar el 28 de septiembre. Porque estas dos pistolas, estas dos pistolas pertenecieron a Bolívar y a Manuela. Y por esas cosas de la vida llegaron a mis manos. Por ahí tengo la carta de un compatriota llamado Ruperti. ¿Quién? Wilmer Ruperti. Él me pidió que yo hiciera público esto y cumplo. Estas no son para mí, por supuesto. Did you see how ridiculous Chavez looks with those two guns raised to his ears? So let me make sure I understand. What Chavez is saying is that these two guns were bought in an auction in New York, and then someone donated them to him, and now he's presenting them to an audience, including members of the military, and who look like politicians. Oh no, the guns were not a donation to him. They were a donation to the Republic. <laughs> See, Chavez used Bolivar to build a nation, create unity, and activate patriotism. Right. Why else would he present them as a spectacle instead of simply encasing them in a museum? He doesn't even really know who owned them. At first he says that he imagines that Manuel Jaisen used them to defend Bolivar. But then he mentions that these guns were Bolivars. So which story is true? I see. So he imagines yet another story when he asked for Bolivar's body to be exhumed. Here's what looks like an army exhuming the bodies. Aquí estamos, tú 
sus hijos. Un momento de mucha emoción, muchísima emoción. decía yo anoche, ¿no? como si estuviera arropado ese es un ataúd de plomo eso que lo cubre, ¿ves? ahí pero está muy lejos esa toma y otra que está más cerca So why did he do this? Chavez constructed Bolivar into a martyr by proposing, proposing assassination conspiracies Bolivar is thought to have died from tuberculosis but Chavez ordered the exhumation of Bolivar's bones for closer inspection we see in this video that the whole process was quite a spectacle the video begs the question, what was the stunt supposed to be obscuring? Chavez embodied many of Bolivar's views, including his anti-imperialist stance in politics. The following video is a speech by Chavez addressing the United Nations General Assembly in 2006. The devil came here yesterday. Yesterday, the devil came here. Right here. Right here. And it smells of sulfur still today. This table that I am now standing in front of. Yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, from this rostrum, the President of the United States, the gentleman to whom I refer as at the devil, came here talking as if he owned the world. Truly, as the owner of the world. So he's talking about President Bush. Seems to completely denounce the United States' foreign policies. He even refers to Bush as the devil, which immediately frames him in the United States, the nation he is the face for, as a stranger, an untrustworthy tempter that should be repelled. The purpose of this video is to make the known Chavez's, and therefore Venezuela's, anti-imperialist stance. It also... It is also meant to unite not only Latin America, but all members of the Global South, as later mentioned in the video. Okay, so the United States, of course, now seems to substitute Spain in Chavez's application of Bolivar's visions. Chavez became so popular through his reimaginings and retelling of Bolivarian stories that an ideology, Chavismo, was named after him. This was made possible largely because of his channeling of Bolivar, but also by his charisma. What better way to continue the independence narrative than to imitate Bolivar's views and work it into the national imagination? I mean, Chavez's channeling of Bolivar is not the only independence narrative seen recently. Look at José Martí and Fidel Castro. Martí's vision is not unlike that of Bolivar's. He also believes in a united Latin America that fends for itself and takes advantage of its untapped potential. If you look at his popular document, Our America, written in 1891, we can see how his use of natural metaphors conveys these views. Jose Martí was also an anti-imperialist who strongly believed in originality. Imitation was the bane of his existence, so to speak. <laughs> One of his most beautiful and prominent quotes is, A cloud of ideas is a thing no armored prow can smash through. A vital idea set ablaze before the world at the right moment can, like the mystic banner of the, most, the last judgment, stop a fleet of battleships. Essentially, what this quote is saying is that ideas are a lot stronger than weapons, because ideas are immortal and will continue long past the death of those who hold them. In a way, what you just said sums up everything we said earlier. The idea of a man and his views have outlived the man himself. We see how these visions are drawn upon and reimagined by Fidel Castro during his defense after attempting to overthrow Batista. One of the most famous speeches in, the La in Latin America is this speech by Castro, later named, History Will Absolve Me. Can you believe that this speech was four hours long? I know, that's crazy. Castro's appeal completely failed as a legal defense. He was still sent to jail. But when you read the speech, it becomes apparent that he is actually addressing the public. So in a way, he accomplished what he set out to do, given that he became president later on. 
So what are some of the ways Castro uses Martí and his visions in the speech? It would seem that Castro was trying to mirror himself to Martí by calling for a revolution against the Batista regime that does not honor the true potential of Cuba and its people. I see. Castro attempts to appeal to the lower class by highlighting their importance in holding the nation together. He does mention that he isn't one to make promises and then break them, as many popular leaders have done. However, that does not mean his appeal to the lower class was not vital to his rise to power. Right. Like Chavez with Bolivar, Castro saw Martí as a martyr. A martyr. Martí spent some time in prison and was exiled along with many Cuban intellectuals in favor of Cuban independence. Castro attempts to become a martyr himself when he sets out to speak to the public instead of properly defending himself. Oh, this explains why the last line of the speech was, history will absolve me. It was more of a surrender than a defense. The history of men makes it seem like events and pivotal changes were marked solely by the hand of one man. Was independence inevitable in Latin America? Could the national independence movements that cascaded across Latin America during Bolivar's lifetime have occurred without Bolivar? Just like Martí's notion, the man as an idea will never die is conveyed by these instances. At its core, the Bolivarian independence narrative insists that, left to their own devices, Latin Americans hold the key to their own success. But the imposition of pressure from above, or from cor corruption within, suppresses this drive. The Bolivarian narrative attempts to unite the oppressed in order to overthrow the oppressors. Bolivar spoke of the permanent infancy of Spanish America under the care of Spain, its unnatural stepmother. Under this oppression, Spanish America could never direct its own growth and maturation. Alexander Dawson discusses independence narratives in his text Latin America since independence. Dawson suggests that nations define themselves through use of stories from the past and move towards a future that does justice to that past. But there are so many discordant nationalisms throughout Latin America. He wonders what stories of the past are privileged, what histories are used in the Bolivarian vision. Does this mean the vision could be manipulated by selecting some stories and leaving others out? An important thing to know as we finish this is that independence narratives are reimagined over and over by different individuals. They are re-embodied and they are timeless as long as the nation exists. Thanks for watching our show and we hope you learned something about Latin American independence narratives.